Welcome to Your Gal Friday, a podcast about female leaders, innovators, and rule breakers. Each week, your hosts, Leah and Phoebe, will shine a spotlight on an amazing gal and talk about what we can all learn from her. Brought to you by Gal's Guide to the Galaxy. Welcome to Your Gal Friday. I am Dr. Leah Leach. And I'm Phoebe Freer. Today we are talking about the first First Lady of the United States, a gal who was widowed twice, spent six winters on battlefield camps, and was a delight to everyone she entertained, even though she wished for a private life. Today we're going to talk about the life and legacy of your gal, Martha Washington. Yep, we are. And and as my roommate uh, suggested, maybe she was the first former First Lady, which is just a tongue twister. Right. <laughs> That would be. Yes, it would. (laughs) (laughs) So I actually knew surprisingly little about Martha Washington, aside from what they tell us in the history books. I pretty much only knew what they told us on Liberty's Kids, which is like a little cartoon TV show that saved me from my history classes. Like, that's why I passed history (laughs) was because of Liberty's Kids. So Ah, shout out to them. Um, But even they didn't talk talk much about Martha Washington and I didn't realize how little I knew about her until I was actually doing research for this show and it's kind of surprising how little I knew right no I'm I'm totally right there with you yeah um I will not lie that I knew very little about her and I I do feel a little bit of shame in it too it's like come on I should totally know um it was one of those things where I felt like I should always know more about her and I I think what it was is there's always been something behind those eyes, you know, of her like portraits that you see of her. Mm -hmm. I felt like she was this complex woman who deserved taking time to know about that. She wasn't going to be an easy study sort of thing. Now, I hate that it's taken this long in my life, (laughs) but I'm so glad we have this opportunity to take the time now and we get to share it with our listeners. We do. (laughs) We get to learn so much and then share so much. It's really cool. We have cool volunteer jobs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like a win-win situation. It's something we always been meaning to do, but we wouldn't do if we didn't have accountability. But totally. then we get so much out of it. It's like, why didn't we do this before? <laughs> exactly. Yep, exactly. <laughs> All right. So let's dig in. Are you ready? I am. All right. So Phoebe, where was she born and where did she grow up? So Martha was born as Martha Dandridge on June 13th. 1731 or on june 2nd which is the old style of dating and this is the date that most people refer back to and i'm not going to get into the old style and new style of dating because that's just was a wormhole that just yeah we're not going to get into that today true so martha was born on her parents plantation in chestnut grove in the new kent county virginia which is roughly 35 miles from the colonial capital of williamsburg So her father was John Dandridge, um, who was a Virginia planter and an immigrant from England, and her mother was Frances Jones. So Martha had three younger brothers and four younger sisters. She, it is said that she enjoyed like riding horses and gardening and sewing and playing the spinet and dancing, like all of the kind of typical modern, um, you know, high end, high class people do at this time. Mm -hmm. So her father saw that she received a fair education in basic math, reading, and writing, which is not something girls primarily gained at this time, but her parents made sure that she did receive a decent education. Very cool. So throughout her entire life, Martha found pleasure and solace in reading. She read the Bible and other literature like that, which was very typical, again, for this time. Um, She also read novels and magazines. Um, Martha was also known for um, being a regular and active letter writer. Um, She had a collection of her surviving letters that are housed in the collections of the Mount Vernon Library right now, which is actually also pretty rare because I read somewhere that Mm -hmm. um, she burned all of like her letters between her and George Washington and that kind of thing before she died because she was a private person. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Very much so. Um, Also, according to Wikipedia, Martha may have had an illegitimate half-sister, Anne, who was born into slavery, and her slave mother was an African-American and Cherokee descent. 
Um, and Martha's father may have also fathered an out of wedlock half brother, which was named Ralph, who was probably white. But again, uh, these sources uh-huh. are kind of sketchy at best. So it it's mm. one of those like it's it's something that could have happened, but it's hard to pinpoint. It's possible. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those yeah. things where it's like, we don't have enough information, but it's right. worth mentioning because exactly. it is possible. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> well, when Martha was 18 years old, she married Daniel Park Custis. Ironically, they lived in a mansion that was dubbed the White House. Now, could this be where later we get the term for the president's home title? I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel was the manager of his father's plantation, not far from where Martha grew up in Chestnut Grove. Daniel was also 20 years older than Martha. His mm-hmm. family was not only wealthy, but they were socially prominent. Daniel's father was on the Virginia Governor's Council. Though Daniel didn't take part in any politics, instead he stayed in farming and he eventually inherited his father's many plantations. Now, Martha and Daniel would have four children together. Daniel Jr. was born a year after their marriage, but he died before he turned three years old. In the next few years, the family grew as Francis, John, and Martha, even though she's called Patsy, were born. Now, around Martha's 25th birthday in 1757, she was delivered two horrible blows. First, her daughter Frances died before turning four. Then a few months later, her husband dies. It's believed he died of a heart attack. He was only 45 years old. So now Martha, at the age of 25, is a widow with two small children. That is I just, I can't imagine. Oh, Yeah. As devastating as this is, Martha did have a rich inheritance, however, for Mm -hmm. her and for her children. And this included a custody of nearly 18,000 acres of land, more than 85 slaves at that time, and spreading over five plantations. Now, she had a powerful estate to manage, but she also had children to raise and protect. And that just seems incredible. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. She was a woman in a man's world at this point. Right. With very little rights to protect her, too. That's yeah. kind of the scary bit. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So with Daniel's death in 1757, Martha was a rich young widow at the age of 25. She enjoyed having a big family, and she was one of eight siblings, as you heard before. And she loved children. So although she was in mourning, she didn't refute the idea of a second marriage. So sometime later, Martha met a young colonel from the Virginia militia at a coalition in Williamsburg. The young colonel fought for the British and the French in the Indian War. His desire was to become a commissioned officer in the Royal Army, but the British never considered it. His name was, of course, George Washington. I know him. <laughs> <laughs> so George Washington likely knew both Martha and Daniel for some time before Daniel's death because he lived in the same area. So during March of 1758, he actually visited Martha twice at what was called the White House. The second time, he had either an an engagement or a marriage proposal for her to consider. And at the time, she was also being courted by by the planter Charles Carter, who was an even wealthier than George Washington. Mm. But Martha decided on George Washington. It turns out that they they hit it off very quickly, and they actually married fairly quickly, and they married uh, January 6th, 1759, which, now that I'm thinking about it, that's my parents' wedding anniversary, not 1759. Oh, wow. But yeah. Right, exactly. The same date, different year. (laughs) Yeah, different year. Fantastic. (laughs) The marriage made George Washington... A even more wealthy planter because of Martha's inheritance from her previous husband, Daniel. So the wedding was grand and Martha had fine clothes shipped from Europe for the occasion. And Washington's suit was one of blue, was blue and silver and with red trimming and gold knee buckles. And also get this, Martha wore purple silk shoes with spangled buckles. I mean, I might just have to yes. steal her idea in the future for my, for my own wedding, like far future wedding. Do that. But still, 
That's I like, like it. A, like, fantastic. Yeah, that's a fantastic idea. Yes, and people will be like, so why the purple shoes? Uh, Martha Washington, Martha if they're Washington. good enough for her. <laughs> right, exactly. If they're good enough for oh, her, they're good it. enough for me. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yep. They honeymoon at the White House for a few weeks, and then they set up at Mount Vernon, which was George Washington's estate. So they actually appeared to have a solid marriage, which is awesome. So Martha and George Washington had no children together, but they raised Martha's two surviving children, her daughter, Patsy, and her son, John. Patsy unfortunately died as a teenager in 1773 during an epileptic seizure. Um, She had seizures during her whole life, but the was hard to pinpoint what was going on and how to treat it and all of that because of the time. Um, she actually died in George Washington's arms. And the following day, um, George Washington wrote to Burwell Bassett, quote, it is, an, it is an easier to conceive than to describe the distress of this family, especially that one unhappy parent of our dear Patsy Custis. When I inform you that yesterday removed the sweet, innocent girl into a more happy and peaceful abode, than any she has met with. The afflicted path she here too has trod. So George Washington canceled all business plans for the next three months so that he could care for Martha. Aww. It, yeah, it was so adorable and amazing, actually. Um, Patsy's death enabled George Washington to actually pay off some British creditors because um, her portion of her father's will then transferred Mm -hmm. to George Washington because she died. Right. Yes, exactly. So Martha and George Washington, they lived fairly well because of her inheritance and because of, you know, everything that her previous husband left her. But there was bad crops and over the number of years, it it took a toll on their finances and they had to really like pull, pull their boots up and, you know, pull through it. Um, They continued their style of living, though, and Martha continued managing the state, including managing their slaves. Right. So now we switch gears a little bit um, to kind of the battle times uh, that we kind of know um, a lot more on George Washington's side of it. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, And to get kind of um, Martha's side of the war, there's actually this really great book that I'm going to recommend to our listeners because it was recommended to me. (laughs) So a shout out to our listener and artist, Bonnie Fallensworth. Uh, She told me about Founding Mothers by Cokie Roberts. And the book profiles the wives of presidents, but also many more gals that were um, very prevalent during the Revolutionary War period as well. So Koki tells their history. She paints this wonderful picture in the eyes of women. So I just love it. So I didn't know until reading Founding Mothers that women would sometimes join their husbands at battlefield camps. Now, I personally didn't think of this uh, because my husband is a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom and I spent, uh, you know, the many months at home near a military base with an infant and of course i was you know stressing my heart out um i knew that i wouldn't want to join him on a battlefield right right totally (laughs) but there there were days where there was an information blackout that i will tell you the thought crossed my mind oh if i was only closer i could have more information so i could really empathize (laughs) with the idea of it yeah Yeah. So women were important at the camps during the Revolutionary War. They cooked, they delivered food, they tended to the wounded, they mended uniforms, they did the laundry, and they put on musical jamborees and plays to keep morale up. Some women got paid half as much of the men, uh, if they even got paid at all. Now, some women even took up arms. There are stories of women who dressed up as men to fight in the war. There were teenage girls like Sybil Luddington, who rode on horseback, double the distance of Paul Revere to warn the towns that the British were coming. There was also Molly Pritcher, who was a water catcher at the Battle of Monmouth. And when all the men in charge of firing the cannons were mortally wounded, she took up the cannons and fired them back at the enemy. Right? What? What? 
I know. It's amazing. Now, George, though, however, was not a big fan of women at the camps. He felt like it distracted the men from their mission. However, every winter, while the fighting was at a standstill, for some odd reason, they didn't fight during winter, especially during uh, Christmas time. There was a standstill. Mm -hmm. George would then ask Martha to come to camp and join him. And this went on for six winters. For six years, she would join him at camp. (laughs) That's adorable. I know. It's super sweet. So even though he didn't really like women there, he's like, yeah, okay, but my wife's pretty cool. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So Martha made the trips from Mount Vernon to the camps of Cambridge, Philadelphia, Morristown, Newburgh, and Valley Forge. Now, when Martha arrived at Valley Forge, Cokie Roberts says in Founding Mothers, quote, 1,500 horses died of starvation and the human conditions were not much better. She talks about how there were chants from the soldiers, no bread, no soldier. This is most likely where the line in the musical, we have resulted to eating our horses, comes from. Oh, wow. That's intense. And true. And intense. Right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Can only... Only, I can't even, no, I can't even imagine. I was going to say I can only imagine. No, I can't even. (laughs) No, I can't. So Martha set up a sewing circle for the officer's wives, and she passed out food and arranged for music and songs. She worked really hard to boost morale. She was also George's right-hand woman. She helped organize his thoughts, settle his mind, and be a compassionate shoulder in troubled times. Martha also acted as his secretary, so look out, Hamilton. She made copies of his letters and she was his representative at important events and it says on mountainvernon.org quote her presence not only fortified her husband but helped boost the morale of the entire camp so how about that what yeah Uh (laughs) take that Exactly. So women would tend to stay for the winter in the camps and then spend the summers back at home. Now, some women didn't have a home to go back to as it might have been burned down or claimed by the British. For the women who were at home during the battles, whether it was at Mount Vernon, whether it was the Schuyler home, whether it was a farmhouse, women were in a constant state of alert. Before America's independence, British officers had the right to anyone's home at any point. Many times, if troops or scouts were in your area, they would stay in your home. Right? So it didn't matter what your allegiance was. By law, you needed to allow them to stay for as long as they deemed fit. And if you were a woman whose husband was away fighting, regardless of which side he was on, there was a real danger for your health and safety as well as that of your kids. Because if you upset the British soldiers during their stay, your home or crops could be burned and you could lose your life. So it was a constant state of alert for a lot of the ladies during the war. Holy crap. That's crazy. Right, isn't it? Oh, it's terrifying. Now, women, including Martha, were now in charge of also running their husband's businesses. So whether that was farming or law or politics or hospitality, like running a tavern, they did all of this on top of raising families, keeping the children fed and healthy, corresponding with friends and families on the situation of the war and politics and home life. And for the women who couldn't join their husbands at camp and the months that they were back home, uh, women were not only on their own, they were always wondering whether or not their husbands would return home. So it was a very stressful time during a very long period of the war. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But then you were digging into when George became president. A little bit, yeah. So after the war, George Washington, so after the war, after the war, after the war, you know, (laughs) anyways, (laughs) Um, George Washington became the first president of the newly formed United States of America. The inauguration was April 30th of 1789, and one source says that Martha actually did not attend. Um, Uh It says maybe she didn't want him to be president, or I don't know. There's not a whole lot of resources that align with it, but I thought that was an interesting tidbit. Like maybe it's a privacy thing or, yeah. So once he did assume office, Martha knew that her actions would be observed closely and maybe even copied by those down the road. 
Um, she hosted many affairs of state at New York City and Philadelphia during their years as temporary capitals. Um, the socializing became known as the Republican Court. The term First Lady was not yet established, but Martha was referred to as Lady Washington. She also had Friday public receptions and handled the household affairs while developing a friendship with Abigail Adams, who was the wife of Vice President John Adams. So the Washingtons relocated to Philadelphia, which was the nation's capital at the time in 1790. So Martha Washington was actually seen as a gracious presence and looked to Europe for inspiration in terms of setting standards for official affairs, though it was noted that she often felt trapped and actually preferred a quieter life. So it is known that the Washingtons owned slaves. Um, we touched on this earlier. Um, they actually owned slaves even separately. So Martha inherited slaves from her late husband and George Washington owned his own slaves. Um, and we'll get more in detail about that in a little later. Um, for now, let me just tell you about one particular slave named Oni Judge. Now, beginning in 1789, Oni Judge worked as a personal slave to First Lady Martha Washington. Um, she worked in the presidential household in New York City and eventually wound up in Philadelphia. So Martha Washington had informed her that she was to be given as a wedding present to Martha's granddaughter since Oni was Martha's favorite and most trusted. I do think it is so still, it, there's still something that turns in me, the idea of giving a person as a present. Ugh, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. As a wedding totally. present. It's, Here is my, very... you know, my most trusted associate. It's like, it's a person. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to wrap your head around. Right. Like, I definitely don't agree with it. Um, But it's right. also, it's, I mean, I definitely don't agree with it. Um, but it's hard to be like, well, hey, Martha Washington was a terrible person. Like, she, she wasn't a terrible person. I mean, even Oni she said... She was a person of her time. Um, yeah. She was a person of her time, exactly. Um, I'll yeah. read later that Oni actually, like, highly respected Martha Washington and enjoyed being with her. But it's like... Yeah. But there's this level that's like, okay, but eventually you have to realize they're a person, you know? Right. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's ultimately why Oni wanted to escape. And she actually mm -hmm. did escape um, with the aid of Philadelphia's free black community. Um, she escaped to freedom in 1796, and she lived as a fugitive slave in New Hampshire for the rest of her life. More is known about her, actually, than any other slave from Mount Vernon, because she was tw interviewed twice by an abolitionist newspapers in the mid 1840s. So that's why there's actually yeah, a lot more out there about her. It's very fascinating. Yeah. Um, she actually decided to escape because if she would have stayed to be given to Martha's granddaughter, she would have been moving back to Virginia where there was no hope of being a free woman. Um, whereas right. she had hope in Philadelphia because of the new Pennsylvania gradual abolition law. Um, this meant that exactly what it sounds like, where they had laws. It, it's very in-depth. There was lots of loopholes and catches and stuff. Um, but instead of explaining all that, basically, um, the Pennsylvania gra gradual abolition law was put in place so that over a period of time when the last slave in Pennsylvania died, all all black people would be free, if that makes sense. Uh okay. So like they gotcha. would eventually all like roll into freedom. So be staying right. in Philadelphia mean hoped for Oni, except that she was gonna be moving to Virginia, which had no hope because it was still in the South. Right, right. Oh, absolutely. Um, so she escaped while she ha had the last chance. Um, but it wasn't because she was beaten or anything like that. In fact, Oni recalled in an 1845 interview that while they were packing up to go to Virginia, I was packing to go. I didn't know where, for I knew that if I went back to Virginia, I would never get my liberty. I had friends among the colored people of Philadelphia. I had things carried there beforehand and left Washington's house while they were eating dinner. Um, there was runaway advertisements in Philadelphia and newspapers, documents, judges escaped freedom for the president's house on May 21st, 1796. 
that appeared in the Philadelphia Gazette on May 24th. So they did actually go looking for her. They posted right. um, advertisements and everything, but they didn't find her. She escaped to New Hampshire. I'm like, yay, she escaped. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. She escaped. I'm Actually, she escaped and married and had children, um, which is fantastic. Yay! She got to live a life on her terms. Exactly. And it's it's awesome. And I, f- I find it interesting because I'm, I'm wrestling with the fact that our founding fathers, you know, own slaves. Like, that's, yeah. that's hard for me to, like, hold on to. Like, for example, if you, you're to, you're supposed to look up to your founding fathers or you're supposed to look up to people who created your own country, right? At least that's the idea. Right. So it's hard for me to do that when they were slave owners. However, it's hard to say that, hey, they're super terrible people. I mean, I don't agree with that. But they're, but even Oni, I want to read this for you because even Oni was like, no, oh, they, they didn't treat her terribly. So they can't have been terrible people. But they they were not developed enough, I guess, in their minds to be like, hey, this is a person. So um, right. Oni, me- Oni said, quote, that Martha felt a responsibility for the unsophisticated girl under her care, especially since her mother and sister were expecting to see her back at Mount Vernon. What she could never understand was that Oni had a simple desire to be free. Ona, as she preferred to call herself, wanted to live where she pleased, do what work she pleased, and learn to read and write. And Ona Judge professed a great regard for Martha and the way she had been treated, but she couldn't face a future as a slave for herself and her children. Which is completely understandable. Like, that's just... Absolutely. Human rights, you know? (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. So after Oni's escape, Martha gave her granddaughter Oni's younger enslaved sister named Delphi and she gave her as a present instead so it's kind of interesting like even though she didn't quite take the hint but I mean it, it's of the times I guess like I'm not saying excuse it but I'm saying like it, it's hard to judge a person by one thing you know right exactly yeah it's it's something that's really it, that uh, it makes us very torn <laughs> Totally. Yeah, Both of exactly. us are very, we like, have a really hard time with slavery and not seeing people as as um as property, you know. It's yeah, very difficult. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're very modern gals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So after George Washington taught us how to say goodbye by stepping down as president, Martha and George returned to Mount Vernon in 1797. It seems that both were relieved to finally return to a normal life away from politics and war. But according to FirstLadies.org, Martha's post-presidential life was filled with entertaining hundreds of guests. So much for a quiet retirement that they were hoping for. Also, George spent his retirement working on his business interests and the plantations. And so it's very easy to assume that Martha was focused on that as well. Now, the plantations, they were not going so well. They were, again, making little money. It seems that the Washingtons actually had more fame and notoriety than money. Historians note that most of the Washington's wealth was actually tied up in unsellable land and slaves that they did not want to separate and the slaves themselves that wanted to be freed and not separated. Right. And I'll actually have Phoebe talk more about that actually in a minute too. Now, perhaps because money was tight or because George was as nonstop as Hamilton was, a year into retirement, then President John Adams asked Washington to be a senior officer of the United States Army. And George accepted. Today, this title is actually known better as the Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Man, the man is nonstop. Right, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) There was worry of another war, this time with France. And so George worked to build a provincial army for any and all emergencies. George once again had Hamilton at his side. But this time... There was no war that actually happened. So there was that. <laughs> there, there was that. Right. <laughs> so two years after stepping down as president, George Washington died, spending several hours inspecting his plantation in the frigid December conditions. Now, first he got sick, 
But he still went back out into the snow and hail and freezing rain, and his condition, surprise, surprise, got worse. Now, it got so bad that he could barely breathe, he couldn't speak, and he couldn't swallow. So three doctors were summoned to Washington's side, and the last words that Tobias Lear documented that Washington said was, "'Tis well." Ooh, those are some tough last words. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. The irony is there. Oh, so now Eliza Hamilton wasn't the only one to have burned letters. To protect their privacy, Martha did burn the letters between herself and George. Only two letters have survived. One is with the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, and another is with the Virginia Historical Society. Now, there are 65 letters of Martha's in the Library of Congress. They are to Martha, and they are from Martha, and they're various correspondence um, with people of history. Now, her letters are generally, they are cheerful. They are supportive, and they're also very matter-of-fact. She gets right to the point of things. What's interesting, though, to note is on the flip side, there's over 135,000 documents called the Washington Papers that are written by Washington and to Washington. And those are housed at the University of Virginia. So we got a lot Whoa. more of George than we got of Martha. <laughs> right. But, but we got something. Also by her right? design. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating because she was, I mean, the women were right. Because Absolutely. we are random Americans who can tell other random Americans how to find personal letters from <laughs> the 17 and 1800s. You know, so they were completely right. right on burning them if they wanted to be private, you know? <laughs> It's right, to absolutely. Them they that. had justifiable reasons. <laughs> they totally did. It's like, oh, I probably would burn them too. Like, that makes sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, one thing we we really did want to talk about, and we did not want to shy away from it, is we wanted to talk about uh, slavery at Mount Vernon because very interesting things happened towards the end of George's life. And Phoebe, right. you've been digging into it, haven't you? Yes. So, as we all know by now, Martha grew up with her father owning slaves, and then she married her first husband, who had at uh, at one point around 300 enslaved men, women, and children, making her husband one of the largest slave owners and wealthiest wealthiest men in Virginia Colony. So, here's where it gets a little complicated. So, when her husband Daniel died, Martha received a, quote, dower share. The lifetime use of and income from the remaining one-third of the estate and its slaves went directly to her. Mm -hmm. After her death, the dower slaves and their progeny were to be distributed among their surviving family of Martha and Daniels, so their heirs and such. Right. So in 1759, George Washington married Martha and became the legal manager of the estate. So at the time of her marriage, Martha's dower share included more than 80 slaves, which again is one third of the whole estate. That's not everything. The dower share is just one third. So she would control any children that the slaves had as well. And and that would become a part of her dower. So estate records indicate that Martha Washington continued to purchase supplies, manage paid staff, and make many other decisions regarding her dower share. I mean, granted, for a lot of it, George wasn't even home. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That's so true. So exactly. So she completely like controlled it all and she managed it, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, And she had to. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that means that she had to manage everything at once or just her dower share because, like, everything had to be managed, but it would eventually be her kids. It's not hers to spend. You know what I mean? Right, exactly. Yeah. Caretaker. If it wasn't actually hers in property, she would at least have to caretake it while George wasn't there. Exactly, yeah. So although the Washingtons wielded managerial control over the whole estate, they received income only from Martha's dower share, which is the third. Um, The remainder of the income went to a trust held for Jackie Kustis until he reached the maturity at age 21. 
So George Washington used his wife's great wealth at this time to buy land and more slaves. He more than tripled the size of Mount Vernon, and for more than 40 years, the dower slaves farmed the plantation alongside her husband's. So by law, neither of the Washingtons could sell the Custis lands or slaves, which um, Martha's dower and trust owned. But after mm-hmm. Jackie died during the Revolutionary War, Jackie's slaves passed on to Jackie's son, George Washington Park Custis, who at the time was a minor. So if Jackie's trust or Martha's dower owned a slave's mother, her children were included in that holding. So some slaves owned by the Washingtons and the trust married each other, formed linked families, and thus creating complex inheritance issues, which is very, right. if for, very complex. Like, If for at least this reason alone, this is why people shouldn't be property. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what I exactly. mean? Exactly. Because it's like, least of course this they're going to... reason, for crying out loud. Yeah, <laughs> at least. It's like, um, you know, of course they're going to be human and marry each other and create children right. and, and have families children and, and love. Oh, and life's going to go I mean, on. Just, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like, come on, let's make, start to make sense here. Um, mm-hmm. So seven of the nine slaves that President George Washington brought to Philadelphia, who, which was the national capital at the time, to work at the president's house were dower slaves. So Pennsylvania passed a gradual abolition law, which we discussed earlier, in 1780. So under... So this law means that non-residents were allowed to hold slaves in the state for up to six months. After that, they they could claim freedom. Well, the Washingtons rotated their president's house slaves in and out of the state before six-month deadline to prevent their established Uh. residency. Right? Like, there's one Uh. thing about owning slaves. There's another thing about... It's like, oh, are you you serious? Mm, Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a thing. <laughs> yeah. George Washington reasons that should the Dowers attain their freedom due to his, quote, negligence, he might be liable uh, to the Custis estates for their value. So George Washington's oh, I, thoughts on slavery yeah. were actually contradictory to himself, and they changed over time. Um, right. It, it, it showed it was more prominent in his will, which... Um, in his will, he wrote that it would free to free all of his slaves upon his wife's death, which would make right. him the only slaveholding founder to put provisions for many missions in his will. Like, oh. the only one, which well, is then, which is all right. Yeah, sure. At least so there was like, at least there was a change of heart. But uh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a little it's a little interesting. So here's, yeah. an, it, it still gets weird, okay, because Yay. George Washington dies before Martha, which means right. his slaves are still slaves and they can't right. be freed until Martha dies. So Martha actually freed George Washington's slaves almost a year after his death because um, there was 123 slaves that he owned outright, separate from the dowry, separate from, I mean, everything about the Custis estate, just all completely right. separate. So there was 123 people knowing that they would be free after Martha's death, and they were worried, she was worried for her life because now that George is dead, like, there could be a revolt, you know, people could... They could be like, okay, well, we'll be free when she's dead, so let's go get her type thing. Right, because there's there's one person standing in your way to freedom. Exactly. There's 123 of you. Yeah, no, yeah, it's reason exactly. for fear. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's reason absolutely. for a thought. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So, um, you know, wisely, Martha freed those slaves on January 1st in 1801. So, actually, in the will as well, in accordance with the state law, Washington stipulated that elderly slaves, or those who were too sick to work, or to be supported throughout their lives by his own estate. So, children without parents, those without family, those who were too poor or indifferent to see their education, were to be bound out to masters and mistresses 
who would teach them reading, writing, and useful trade until they were ultimately freed at the age of 25, which is also gotcha. fascinating because he not only wanted to get have them freed, he wanted them right. to be cared for. So it's he's got this and weird mix. And self-sufficient, eventually. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It so is a contradiction, isn't it? It is. It is. And it, it makes me wonder what Mar like... Did Martha have an aha moment? Because these are all Washington or George Washington's thoughts right. in, in his will. So what did, you know, did she ever agree with him or anything like that? You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. What were her thoughts on the issue? Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's such a, a difficult part of history. And it is something because... um. Uh, I have people on my side of the family that were on the British side and totally. it has come up uh, through research that some of the thought of staying on the British side instead of on the American side was the founding fathers, how they were a contradiction right. of all persons are freed yet they own slaves. So right. that was part of it. Or they believed in small government yet they were creating a large government. And so it, it's it's still hard for me to wrap my brain around, it but is, I, yeah. I I start to see it in these little bits where it's like, oh, these are some tough contradictions. And if you have a line in the sand of, you know what I mean, uh, people are people and the abolitionist movement and small government, yeah, I can kind of understand. <laughs> yeah, completely. So in later years, um, living now as a widow for the second time in her life, Martha stayed at Mount Vernon, and her health was never quite the same after George's death. But she entertained John and Abigail Adams, as well as future presidents and first ladies, John Quincy and Louisa Adams, James and Dolly Madison. She wanted to stay a private person. However, she seemed to know that her life was very much of public interest. Now, Martha died only a few years years after George in 1802. She was 70 years old. She was surrounded by her grandchildren and her great grandchildren. She had actually outlived all of her children. So Phoebe talked about Patsy's death at the age of 17. There's also another letter at mountvernon.org. It relays a letter that George wrote to his brother-in-law when Patsy died about her burial. And it says that it quote, almost reduced my poor wife to the lowest ebb of misery. Mm. So that was, you know, oh. Now, John, who's actually known more as Jackie, we've been referring to him as Jackie. That's pretty much what he went by. That right. was Martha's oldest son. And Jackie married and had four children. That is how her legacy continues. That is how the, you know, Martha Washington line keeps going. Now, Jackie right. was a civilian. He was an aide to camp, and he was based in the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. This is where he came down with yellow fever. Uh, George and Martha then took in two grandchildren and raised them as their own. Now, Martha was eulogized in the newspapers as, quote, the worthy partner of the worthiest of men. Wow. And that is how she was eulogized. Right? Exactly. So when it comes to legacy, my goodness, what legacy do you think she wanted to leave behind? Oh, wow. I think, first off, she wanted to leave behind a legacy in numbers, um, meaning she wanted more children and grandchildren and didn't get as many as she wanted because they kept you know, passing away and all of that. Yeah. Which is really rough. I think that she had a lot of maybe quote unquote British ideals, like where she grew up, right? And like she she wanted to pass on the like the proper way of life, but also like mm -hmm. the proper way of raising a country because that's where right. she was at. Like that's what the position she was given. I don't know if she knew that she was building a a legacy or a pattern or the way of living, but I think she knew that she was kind of in the spotlight and that mm. her legacy would be how she helped raise the country. Like she didn't she didn't raise as many children as she wanted, but she raised a country, you know, and I think ultimately Very good that point. that is that is the legacy, you know. 
I will admit she was a hard one for me this week with the uh, with the legacy question. You know what I mean? Totally. Especially. Yeah. Um, so what I kind of thought is um, I went to the musical. Uh, so the musical says the legacy planting a seeds in a garden you never get to see. So I kind of thought of it in terms of that. And I honestly, I get this feeling that Martha was too busy trying to keep a family healthy, a plantation afloat, the heads of state entertained, that I think she left most of the seed planting to George. I mean, he was doing amazing things and people loved him and it seemed to be working. So, I mean, I I still, I really, I get this sense that she wanted to be this private person and she wanted to keep her attention on immediate priorities. You know what I mean? Because I really think when you have like so much death around you for most of your life, um, you Mm -hmm. know, her own children, but also being on battlefields for crying out loud. um, I wonder if your priorities just change that you cling to those that are still around you. You know what I mean? And you put your energy into them and your love into them. So I'm going to go with my gut instinct is that her grandchildren, yeah, were her legacy. Um, Because really, in the end, that was all she had left uh, was her grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I mean, um, she must have known how much she was beloved by the nation. I just get this feeling, and I can't explain why, that maybe it didn't matter to her, actually, that she was beloved by the nation, because I think she would have traded all of it for just one more day with her children. I don't know. That's just my guess. That's that feeling, you know what I mean? Just from spending time with her. Definitely. That I kind of yeah, got. That seems yeah. accurate to me. <laughs> yeah. Hard right. to argue with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but what did you learn from Martha? This is a tough one. Um, I feel like what I learned is almost not from her because, but also it's like from It's because of her, not from her, if that makes sense. Right. That's still a Um, learning lesson. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know our stance on slavery. The viewers know our stance on slavery by now. Like, people are people, period. But with Martha, Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, they own slaves. I don't like that at all. Okay. But I've got to learn. But I've learned to be like, okay, but they did try to be good people. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's this learning of, okay, let's be mature about the, about the topic and understand it from a historical point, because I was talking to my roommate who does a lot of like history research and that kind of thing. And I was like, okay, how do I wrap my head around this? Because she's a founding mother, you know, and I don't think she's Mm -hmm. like, my gut's like, no, she's not a bad person. But she owned 300 slaves. Like, that's hard for me. Right, exactly. You You can't avoid Um, that. Right. Don't dance around that. Right, yeah. (laughs) Exactly. So it's like, but coming at it from a historical perspective and being like, okay, that's one aspect of life that was there and we're going to face that and that's, that's what happened. But... You also don't have to say, hey, Martha Washington was a terrible person. Like, you don't have to say that. You know, you can... Right. Because you can look at it with perspective and see that she was a good person still deep down. So, I mean, it's hard to explain, I guess, but it's... That's kind of what I've been learning this week. I'm with you. You learn that not everybody's perfect. Right. Exactly. And we don't have to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially real life historical figures. Totally. Not perfect. <laughs> not perfect. Not, We've all not got all. flaws in some way. <laughs> oh, yeah. So what about you? What did you learn? Uh, it was I really thought about it, too, because so many people have uh, written in their accounts of Lady Washington, uh, that they just loved being with her. So many people write about, oh, I got to spend right, time with yeah. Lady Washington. And they just love talking to her and being with her and telling other people. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't expect that, actually, because I was I was thinking, okay, first lady, like, okay, you could be a nice, loving person at first, but eventually you're going to break down and you're going to be the bratty one or something, you know, you're going to be... Right. Like, no, like, I didn't read any of that. <laughs> Like uh-huh, everybody just loved exactly. being around her. You know what it did make me wonder, though? I wonder mm. if she had two sides. I wondered if she had the public, entertaining, 
on, you know what I mean, side. Right. And then she had a private side. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I really do wonder because when you really um, talk about the the wanting to have a private life, a lot of times that's I will put on a face and I will entertain, but I really just want to be by myself and take my shoes off. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And and because of those burnt letters, we we will never know the the private side. And that is okay. Because all of us should be able to have that honor, you know what I mean? Right. Of keeping totally. a private life private. So I completely understand. Um, I also learned, you know, by empathizing with Martha, that she was stood by George's side during battlefields and during houses of government. And I'll bet you it was not easy cleaning up that emotional and physical mess so that your partner can then shine in the eyes of a nation. You know what I mean? That that's got to be difficult and draining for sure. Um, It's one of those things where I'll bet you it never seemed like the work was ever enough and it never seemed like the work would ever be done. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of tough. But what I, I really learned is that Uh, Through all the things in her life that were thrown at her, she decided to not let it break her. She decided instead to let it strengthen her. And I think that's important for human life that you have to decide if you're going to let life's difficulties break you or strengthen you. It is a choice. It really, really is. Um, And it's a choice that sometimes you have to make every single day. Is this going to break me or is this going to strengthen me? So, and I, I, I see that in Martha. I see that it strengthened her in her resolve in many variety of different ways. Um, I also learned that l- your legacy is momentary. It's mm-hmm. not looking l- long-term, which she might have done. And I think she did at times, but I think it was looking more of what can you do in this moment that matters to someone. And I did think that Martha's legacy was an interesting take on legacy. Mm -hmm. That if it was momentary, I can do this right now. (laughs) And that's it. I'm just going to do this right now. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. (laughs) Did you have any final thoughts? So last week, Leah had a familial family connection to the Skylar sisters, which was really cool. And I'm not trying to like, you know, compete or anything. But this week, I actually have a family connection, which is pretty cool. Yay! Okay. It's not competing. Yeah. It's enjoying the splendor of being connected to America's founders. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's really cool because our listeners probably have family connections as well, which would be fascinating yeah. to hear about. Absolutely. Too. Okay, so it goes like this. Martha Washington's great-granddaughter married Robert E. Lee, who we all kind of know, you know. I am actually related to Robert E. Lee through marriage by his brother. So my mom's grandmother's maiden name is actually Lee. Like that's how close the family wow. connection is. Like I am I am just one marriage away from being um blood related to Martha Washington, which is insane. Look like at I read that, that I that's read really that cool. about Yeah, I read that about Martha Washington's great granddaughter and I'm like quickly messaging my mom like, "Mom, isn't this true that we're related to Robert E. Lee? How? Like am I blood related to the Washingtons? I don't know." Like, ah. Right. <laughs> you know, but it exactly. was really cool. Like I am I am just like a marriage away. It's an it's crazy how family connections mm-hmm. and ties go like that but it's also it's not one of those things that like i can research exactness of everything because mm-hmm. um our family history and our family tree was all written in this family bible and it kind of magically disappeared because my mom's family is from the south of course mm-hmm. and so they were embarrassed and somebody you know Magically, the d- Bible disappeared, and it's like, okay, so we kind of know it this, totally we happens. kind of know that, yeah, it happens, so like mm-hmm. but it's like so close, so it's it's very fascinating how me and Leah both have family connections to each episode, right, exactly it's it it actually the neat thing about genealogy and looking at this is you start to see how small the world actually becomes. And how interconnected we really are. I mean, there's the whole six degrees of separation thing. You know what? Sometimes that's like by blood. You are six degrees separated by blood from everybody on the world. It's, (laughs) It's quite interesting. And you start to see a shared humanity. 
you know what Absolutely. I mean? After, after time and looking at generations and learning their story. So uh, I just, I love that you were digging into genealogy because it's yeah. more detective work like we already do. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's I so much love fun. it. <laughs> <laughs> Booyah. Well, that wraps it up for us. Oh, wait, we got this letter from an A. Burr in regards to our next episode. It reads, Dear Theodosia, what to say to you? You have my eyes. You have your mother's name. When you came into this world, you cried and it broke my heart. Well... Now here at Your Gal Friday, we are going to dedicate an episode to you, Theodosia. You will come of age with our young nation. We'll bleed and fight for you. We'll make it right for you. We'll lay a strong enough foundation and we'll pass it on to you. We'll give the world to you and you'll blow us all away. So we're off next week for Easter, but we are going to come back on April 6th and we are going to be talking about the two Theodosias. Burr. So until then, we leave you with this quote from Martha Washington. The greater part of our happiness or misery depends upon our dispositions and not upon our circumstances. For more information about this week's gal or to check out our previous episodes, visit galsguide.org. To support the show, visit the Gals Guide Patreon page. We love our patrons and offer exclusive perks and behind the scenes access for as little as $1 a month. Thank you so much for subscribing to Your Gal Friday.